So how many of you uh, are from biological backgrounds? Can you raise your hands? A lot of you, okay. So I'm not, not a mathematician, so it, the, the, the title of the uh, meeting itself is pretty intimidating for me. I, I do algorithms primarily, I come from a computer science background, but then some little bit of maths uh, is becoming very uh, important for us, uh, especially when it comes to deep learning in machine learning. Not much, uh, I would say. So today I will try to cover um, some fundamental aspects of neural networks, just like A, B, C, D of neural networks, right? And I'll go very slow, one and a half hours. I'll try to cover a few uh, important concepts, uh, you know, as deep as possible. And then I'll see how, how um, it goes, okay? Okay, so the idea is, and let me know if you can see what I'm writing here. So neural networks, uh, what do you know about it? It's very funny, when I, we were doing research, I did, I did my PhD back in 2009 to 2013. And at that time, uh, at ISI, at that time, neural network was fading away, actually. But all of a sudden, people got a lot of interest in neural network uh, with the advent of hardware. The neural networks are already there. Most of the important discoveries are already done. It's just that when the hardware uh, started uh, sprawling, right, then people again um, uh, uh, shook themselves out of comfort and then say, okay, we can do so many things with neural networks because it's computationally extremely, uh, it's, it's computationally expensive. Okay, this is one thing we know about neural network for sure. Uh, but now with now with GPU and high performance computing, and with the dropping price of the computing uh, uh, by and large, we are again uh, looking at neural network in a big way. And this time it's uncontrollable, right? So, so what is a neural network? So neural network is inspired by biology, okay? So we have about 100 billion neurons in our body, in the adult human body. So, and they are connected like, you know, something like this, you have a body and then you have exons. So this is like input and output, okay? So th it has nucleus, this is a neuron. This is the cartoon of a neuron, so you have nucleus. This is the nucleus, and then you have dendrites, okay? And then you have axons, and then you have axon terminals, axon terminals, okay? So this is the construction of a neuron, right? Oh, I don't know anything about all this <laughs> details. <laughs> You're a biologist as I guessed. Okay, so no, so I don't know anything more about this, frankly speaking. So this is neuron. There are so many other things, but basically what inspired computer science folks is to simplify this whole thing and think of it like neurons are connected as networks, like 100 billion neurons, right? 100 billion neurons is a big deal. These neurons are pretty long. And they're connected and they take inputs from here through the dendrites and then they uh, provide output impulses which are then taken forward by the other neurons and it goes on and on and on, right? Our whole body is connected to, with our brain through this neural network. So bio basically was the beginning. So the inspiration came from bio. And then it uh, went to computer science. Okay, so people created, people like Richard Hinton. Do you know some other names of the scientists, apart from Hinton, who won the Turing Awards? Lakin? A good fellow wrote the book. <laughs> Bengio. Joshua Bengio and Hinton, and of course, uh, Jan Lakin. The three guys, there are many other, even Andrew NG had seminal contributions. There are many, many people, right? I don't know all of their names. Fei Fei created the image net and all of that. So there are, there's a laundry list of names. So don't worry about that. So it's a huge field, right? Um, 
Canada was working on this when everybody slept off. <laughs> they continued funding, uh, you know, neural network research when others stopped. In fact, they kept funding, um, uh, you know, this thing called uh, quantum computing, right? So they're extremely ahead of the rest of the world in a few important uh, developments. Interesting. So then this is the computer science stuff. And then it again feeds back to biology. And today you will see that. Amazing, right? It's a cycle. The cycle of life. So we started with neurons and we created neural networks. We created the mathematics and the algorithms for neural network. And then it's helping biology more than anything else. This is like the cyclic process of um, interdisciplinary research and development. Okay, so in the second half of my uh, talk where I'll talk about our research, we'll show some applications of machine learning and deep learning where you'll try, you'll be able to connect what's going on. So today, uh, my job is to give you an excerpt of the founding stones of neural network, not much, just intuitions. I'm a very intuitive guy, right? Now, um, coming to chat GPT, this is probably the most popular uh, neural network that the human race is familiar with. So any idea how many neurons it has? The artificial neurons. The artificial neurons look like this. Just guess what? This is just like, so you have some inputs coming in like X1, X2, X3. In biological terms, you can say this is gene one, gene two, and gene three. And you are going to predict, you are, you are kind of applying some weights here, W1, W2, W3. And you are trying to um, have the, for all i, that means you are trying to do a weighted sum, take the weighted sum of all of that. You're multiplying the input with the weights. And then you are trying to apply some activation function here to get some output. Okay, we'll come there. So you get some output here. And then you compare whether the output is something that you actually wanted. And thereby you can, you can change the weights a little bit to make sure your output is actually matching with what's right. That's the whole thing, it's no, no big deal, right? Now, essentially, what is so important in this whole picture is this bunch of weights. Any idea how many billion dollars this uh, company is worth? Open AI. I mean, tens of, right? Let's say $20 billion. $20 billion is the worth of Open AI. Let's imagine, okay? And that's all basically the bag of weights. Right? If you take this weights, then the company is gone. And each iteration of, because this is a process which doesn't happen in the single shot. Does it? Because you're iteratively training it, you're adjusting the weights. Like if I, if I were to place this table here, I'll have to move a little bit because I'm taking manual judgment, right? I'll probably start from here. Then I'll go there and look at it and say, okay, it doesn't, it doesn't look placed properly. So I'll a little bit push there. And eventually uh, I will satisfy somebody standing there. And this is exactly what is happening in the neural networks, nothing else. You're just adjusting things to look good. So it's a bunch of weights. So it's a very funny way to look at this entire thing. And these iterations are in neural network language called epochs, right? And each epoch for OpenAI arguably costed them about, I guess, a million dollar or so, right? So they actually burned a billion dollar even before coming into existence, right? So that's the kind of hedge that you need to take in. So I'm trying to give a little bit of perspective, like how neural networks can, uh, you know, uh, change and transform uh, different worlds. Now, um, there are so many other examples, like I'll talk about my own group's work about how we can take gene expression values and predict that which drug would, like on one hand, I can give, let's say I have a tumor, right? And tumor can be summarized with a bunch of gene expression values, can't they? You can do a transcriptomics on the tumor, you can get a bunch of gene expression values, and you have drug molecules, right? And it, it can be represented uh, as a vector as well. Now you combine them all, 
and you do whatever sum and then whatever activation, this activation is basically response, right? Let's say there are two friends, like you two guys, right? And you have, um, you know, uh, there's a telephone bill that you have got, which uh, pissed your father off, right? Like you were kids. Now the same telephone bill will not piss off uh, an industrialist who is worth trillion dollars or billion dollars, whatever. So the activation, uh, the response is different. The input could be the same, the response could be different. It's very subjective. It depends on what you really want to achieve. So this activation function actually determines the response. You are combining everything, then you're sending output, but you, you do a little bit of tweak in the output, right? We'll see that. So basically, uh, so you take the tumor gene expression profile and then the drugs and you do a series of this summation and activation and you keep doing that until you have correct predictions for pretty much everything. Like, you know, should I apply a drug, let's say alpilisib, alpilisib, right, like pick three. Should I apply this on this, yes or no, on this particular patient? That's contingent on so many other things, right? The structure of the drug is encapsulated in this vector form. The tumor is encapsulated in this vector form. And at the end of the day, you are trying to predict uh, the correct output that whether there'll be response or not, almost correctly. Let's say this is a wrong prediction. This is an error. So that's what we are doing, right? IBM Watson was not a neural network, by the way. So they, you know, so there was a huge backlash, you know, so the political party. Anyway, let's not go there, but basically it was a smart system. So they wanted to use some doctors and learn some principles and some rules and then teach the computers those rules instead of trying to come up with a neural network. So this is why they failed, because every cancer is different, so heterogeneous, okay? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Correct. Well, so it is a simple, uh, fully connected neural network, you can imagine. So there are layers in between. This is a neural network like this. So uh, half of these values are actually the tumor values and half of these are actually the drug values. And then you are propagating these signals forward. This is fully connected. So you can have different kinds of connections. You may not always have full connections because that's expensive. But there will be many hidden layers. There'll be many hidden layers. There are let's say three hidden layers. And then there's an output layer. And then you are comparing your observation with your output right, your output with your target. And then you are trying to minimize this, the difference, the square difference of them. To be more precise, you're trying to do this one, right? So that this two gets canceled out at the time of derivation. But anyway, that's not the point. The point is, these are enormous use cases of neural networks. So you need to learn it. So I just wanted to establish that you, you really, need to learn it and you're learning probably many of you the learning will start today and then you'll go back you'll do some you'll study further and uh, there are so many beautiful lectures on the internet i'll try to provide some resources as we go yeah not really it's never guaranteed right like there is no guarantee that i'll be able to complete this lecture <laughs> how can we guarantee the neural networks so what happened, this is an excellent question, which I would come much after, which is you always, you try to, basically what's happening, uh, many of you would know, is a feedback. You're trying to minimize something, some error, right? So you always reach some um, suboptimal. So this is the dip, right? This is the best that you can get. You are trying to minimize the error. This is the global optimum but you always get trapped into some local optima more often than never, right? So this is the global optima. This is the lowest of the dips that you can see here, whereas you may very well get stuck here, given that you had started your walk from here. 
So we'll come to this kind of things later. So this is an optimization problem that we are trying to solve. Okay. All right. Now let's get started with some simple, simple neurons and perceptrons. Okay. Now um, neural networks can be used to solve a bunch of problems. I'll be giving uh, examples of mostly, I don't know whether I should erase these things off. I mean, just go somewhere else. And um, so what does a neuron look like is this. You are taking a bunch of the simplest thing, okay? So neuron, this is a neuron. There are, there are two halves to it. In the first half, you are combining all the inputs that you receive. And then you are sending output after applying some kind of a activation function, right? So we call it an activation function. So you do something on top of this combination that is called activation, activation function, correct? So, so you have this kind of inputs coming in. Let's say there are three inputs. As I gave an example of three gene expression, and from that, let's say you want to predict that, okay, what is the grade of the tumor or what could be, whether you should apply a certain drug on that or not, right? So this could be gene one, gene two, gene three, and some numerical values of that, like this is like 20 molecules, this is 200 molecules, this is something else in some normalized form. And then you are doing this linear combination, right? Linear combination. What is linear combination? Linear combination is basically the input, which I can call, let's say, uh, here I have written as G, let's call it X1, X2, X3. And then you have weight one, weight two, weight three. This is a simple perceptron, by the way. I'll show you a linear example first, and then I'll show you a nonlinear example. Okay, so this sum is nothing but summation of W, I, X, I, that's all, right? So you are just taking a sum of that. You can add some bias here. So let's, let's not worry about that right now. Let's not make it even worse. So you have some linear combination of these weights. Now you take these weights and let's say the weights give you a number 55. And you simply ask that whether 55 is greater than zero or less than zero, greater than zero or less than equal to zero. So that is a threshold. So you can apply a threshold. So there is something that you can use called a threshold, right? What does it mean? It means that, let's say, this is your expense when you are a kid, right? Your expense in um, your monthly expense, your pocket money. And every time, you cannot create your own pocket money. You are dependent on your father or mother. So now, up to certain time, he is okay, right? There's no problem, zero. His anger, is not changing at all, it's zero. Up to certain, let's say um, 2000 rupees. And then when it increases, then he's super angry, right? And now it is, let's say something else, okay? Now it is one, this is zero, this is one. So this is kind of an activation function. It, it is drawn like a binary thing. You will either get zero or one. So up to a certain limit, he's okay actually, he's not bad. But beyond that, no matter what is the value, is equally angry. That may not make sense always, right? But that still makes sense in many cases. And therefore, you have an array of different activation functions. Like you can have a function like this also, right? Okay, which gradually increases. It's not like this step function. It gradually increases. We can call it a sigmoid or logistic function. Or logistic function. And here you have this, now, now you can relate to this. So whatever you are getting is a combination of these weights and the values. And then it's up to you. But in the end of the day, this is just a, this, this will give you a number, isn't it? Is it will give you a scalar value. Do you get it? It will give you a number as simple as that. A real number, whatever number. Now, on top of that, you want to apply some kind of an activation function. 
right? You, you know, and, and then you want to send the output. It's always, it's not necessarily monotonic, like, I mean, in this case, it's just like a step function, right? It can be linear also, let's say. It can be like this also. There are different kinds of activation functions. But the idea of having something like this is, I'll try to explain to you, it's a very interesting concept. As I told you, I'll, I'll try to teach you a few concepts today. But before I get there, let me first finish this. So you apply something and then you have the output, right? And then you compare the output with your known target because you know the ground truth, whether this patient is doing well with the drug or not. So you're comparing with this and then, then you are adjusting the weights. So the whole point is you compare the output with the target and adjust the weights. So if I, uh, if I were to summarize, so you, you start with, random weights, random weights, and then you compare prediction with targets, and then you adjust the weights to make sure, to make sure The error at step two, step two, this is this one, step two is least, as less as possible, as simple as that. Understood? Not tough, right? Yes. That's an excellent question. So that will just confuse <laughs> the overall learning, right? It will, it will uh, work neutrally perhaps. If you have many such examples, they will have a neutral effect. That's the simplest exp explanation I can give off the bat, okay? Oh, that happens, that happens. Let's say, I'll, I'll give you a biological example. Let's say you are looking at the mutations and from that you are trying to predict the response to the drug. And the mutation is just a construct of genome, right? But your epigenome might be different, right? So if you can, you can actually, in theory, have identical genomes, cancer genomes, but the epigenome could be different. The methylation patterns could be different. The gene expressions could be different. And you can have totally different consequences. Understand? It is possible. But if you have many such examples, then they will neutralize each other's effect. But this is all, all that I'm saying here is not so rosy. I mean, neural network is extremely sensitive to <laughs> noises also, so you'll have to use certain other tricks to ensure that uh, it does not catch noise too much, like dropouts, et cetera. in a way the same thing, right? I mean, we can keep thinking about it, but overall, if you have such, I mean, such things only happen in an outlierish scenario, right? You don't happen, you don't see those kind of things happen too many times, but, but valid, I mean, I, in my lab, and Abhishek is sitting here, my student, he, he encountered such a situation where the, the two genomes which are identical in micro, microorganism genome, I'm not talking about human genome, but they have very different sensitivities to drugs. Now, some, there, there is some other explanation to it, as it seems. So let me make some progress from here, guys, okay? So this one here is called perceptron, right? So you know a little bit of neural network today. Now, I'll give you a simple algorithm to train it. How about that? Simple algorithm to train this single neurons, neuron. And train for what? So train for a situation like this, let's say you have, uh, you have some, yes. I will just uh, then erase this part, okay. Because I was thinking if, oh, it is being recorded, that's why. <laughs> okay, no problem. 
Okay, so I'll operate here as much as possible. This side is fine. Okay. Do do not. Oh, so there is a vertical line. Do not cross. Okay, got it. No, now now let us learn about a simple algorithm for training this neural network. About that, but why do you want to actually train this neural network? Let's see that this is not required, so I can just erase this part. Okay, so why do you need to train neural network? So basically, to um, okay, before I get there, let me also tell you a little bit about the linear activation functions and nonlinear activation functions. Sorry, nonlinear activation functions. Yes. This is exactly what I'm going to say here. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That is just like regression in uh, in a different way. But let's let's look at it. I mean, I'll give you a better example why you need different kinds of activation functions. Um, for instance, if you have recorded some values for anything, let's say, let's say. Uh, it's very difficult to, for me to imagine an example for that, but just artificially and mechanically try to understand this. If you have some values here, this, this ones, right? Um, and this is a single dimension, like x equal to 3, x equal to 3.9, x equal to uh, 4, right? These are the three values. And then you have another kind of, uh, another set of, values or elements for which you have different numbers here, okay? So let's say this is x equal to 1, this is x equal to 1.2, etc., and this is x equal to 5. Now how to separate them? Can you really draw a line that separates them, right? So a linear kind of a function will not work here. So therefore, you need this nonlinear thing. So interestingly, if you just, you take this x, right? You understand what I'm saying? If I draw, uh, OK, let me just try to draw this. If I draw a line like here, OK? So does it segregate them accurately? No. No matter how you draw the lines, it's not going to work. There will be a lot of errors. So. On the contrary, if you have x versus x square kind of a plot of the same set of values that you can observe here, you're just doing x, you, you have created a new dimension, x square. That's all you have done. All of a sudden, it would look like, any guess? It would look like this. And you will have let's say this values here, okay? So then they become perfectly separable. I don't know how many of you have studied uh, SVM. So they are also use similar kind of tricks. We call it kernel trick or whatever. So nowadays people don't learn SVM by the way, after the neural network became so popular. It's still uh, one of the most robust uh, mathematics. Uh, I mean, fundamental uh, theory behind um, learning. You understand, there is a point in nonlinear activation because there are situations. I give you more examples. This is a one dimensional example. I give you examples like this, where let's say two dimensional, I have things like this, and I have things like this. This is perfectly linearly separable. But what about I have these values and then these values? If we use linear methods, so this kind of things you can learn, this kind of decision boundary, this is called decision boundary, you can actually learn. But you cannot learn decision boundaries like this. That's very difficult. So you need different kinds of nonlinear and linear activation functions. Sometimes you combine them too in a neural network. So far, things are still very simple. I have just talked about a single neuron. Just let me summarize. I have talked about neurons in humans. 
and then artificial neurons. And I have given you an architecture of the artificial neuron, which resembles greatly with a biological neuron. It's just that we have given an expression to it, which is the sigma, and then you're applying some kind of a threshold function, which is the reaction. It's like you are taking some input, but you are also mixing up some bit of your reaction to it. And that becomes essential to learn different kinds of decision boundaries much more efficiently. And there are many different kinds of activation functions. They look different in shapes, right? Like the sigmoidal or the linear. I don't think there's any weight lab experiment that inspired uh, this thing. I think people just studied. There are beautiful diagrams. I forgot. I'm very bad with names, but I think there are some biologists. You guys will be able to tell somebody who drew all these neurons. This was that. Yeah. So all, when you look at all those things, you get inspired, right? Like what inspired random walk? The movement of pollens, right? in some media, it's pollens, right? So it moves erratically, randomly. So that inspired random work ideas, a lot of random work research. Similarly, when you look at something like this, uh, you know, uh, a physicist perhaps would think, or mathematician would, or perhaps applied mathematician will think of this kind of architecture. It's, by the way, it's not, for a mathematician, this might not be a very difficult task to, <laughs> you know, solve the maths, right? But yeah, sorry. Yeah, there is a feedback, there's a feedback. And that's the next part we'll get into. There has to be feedback mechanism. If you look at this particular algorithm that I, oh, this is now rubbed off. So here I wrote about it, <laughs> it was there. I said, you have some random weights you were starting with. And then you are observing how much is the difference between the prediction and the target, and then you're adjusting it. So it's there. Now how to adjust them is the whole thing, right? That's the most difficult thing to understand, how to adjust them. And how to adjust them, yes. Yes. <laughs> you, can, you can do any classification. Okay. Yeah, so let, we want to we want to cover certain things. I promise I just write down your questions. If it is within my knowledge, I'll answer, answer that. But you can Yes, yes. Yes. So you can ask me any question that stops you, impedes your next set of learnings from this class, okay? Right now, we ask those kind of questions, and then we get into more philosophical questions and research questions. But I really, really appreciate, but I actually taught you a few very important take-homes, like the sigmoid functions, like the necessity for nonlinear activation, and, and the fact that nonlinear, so this is a good example to show that how nonlinear activation, you simply did a square, and now you have all of a sudden two dimensions. And within these two dimensions, you can segregate these two points very easily, right? So you created a dimension out of thin air, okay? So now I'll give you a simple algorithm to teach uh, how to train a linear, how to train a perceptron, a single neuron, okay? It might not sound so exciting, but that is essential, right? So let me, let me do that here. Hmm. So how do you think, um, so let me use some different, strikingly different uh, chalk. So first step, you have inputs. The inputs are like um, input features, input features. Features, what are features, first of all? How many of you know what are features? You just raise your hands. In machine learning terminology, do you know what is feature? No? Okay, so just, just, just two minutes. So this, these are things which I want to teach you, right? Like this is gene expression, that is a feature. 
in expression one, let's say this is epcam, and this is some keratin, right? And this is something else. So these are like genes. You have uh, 20,000 genes. These are called features. And then you have samples in a matrix, right? This is tumor one, tumor two, tumor three. These are samples. So when you feed the, ne the neuron, this artificial neuron that I drew just now, when you feed this some um, values like this for one tumor, let's say tumor from X, the tumor from X would give you, let's say, in a simple world, just three gene expression values for three different genes. That's all. So gene expression one, gene expression two, gene expression three. And you do some kind of a summation, as I said here, and then you apply some activation function. That was the thing, right? Now, input features will be called, let's say, instead of G1, I call it X1 for X2 and X3. So these are your features, that features, features of your tumor. That's the easiest way to understand that, okay? So calculate, how to calculate the weight? Calculate the weight up to this part is very simple. You are basically doing for all i, you are doing w i x i, this is also very simple. Then you are adding something called a bias, okay? So bias is uh, like, if you, if you have this kind of a line going to the center, you can just add plus c, then you, it will start going like this. So bias uh, could be there, okay? So uh, this is just a single value. You want to learn that too, and you want to learn this once. So what are you actually trying to learn are these things, okay? And then you apply some kind of an activation. Uh, activation is based on if this overall sum, if this entire thing, let's say, let's call it something, let's say um, A, okay? If this thing is greater than some threshold, which is usually zero, if the values that you get after this summation, all these weights and whatever, you, you started with some random weights, you multiplied with gene expression values, you get a summation, you had some bias, you added that, you got a value, let's say that value is 55 in this case, and it is greater than zero for sure, so you say this is one. Otherwise, you say, otherwise, you say zero. Zero. Okay, a simple linear, you know, this kind of a binary kind of a thing. All right, and now what you are doing is you are comparing with the real, because machine learning starts with real examples. Even before trying to predict things, you need to first know the answer. So how the data will be given to you, like this is tumor one, tumor three, tumor four, tumor five, and let's say out of this, these three are actually responsive to, let's say, PD-1, you know, the immunotherapy, let's say, whereas these guys are not responding, and now you have their gene expression values. So you know for 100 people, you are working with the hospital, you know for these 100 people that these guys have responsiveness, you know, from the past, and these guys don't. And that's what is being used here to train a neural network. And it will make some prediction. Now the prediction will be garbage, right, to start with. Don't you agree? You are setting some weights and the bias randomly. The first iteration, you were, you, were, you were giving some random values to them. Don't you think they will collapse and make a terrible prediction? <laughs> they will. And let's say you have 100 such examples of responsive, 100 such examples of non-responsive. So it starts making terrible predictions because random values. Now when they do, then you adjust the weights a little bit. Uh, like the fourth thing will be adjusting the weights. Um, okay, so this is the delta, delta of uh, wi, so the little bit of adjustment that you are going to do to the weight, because adjustment is the next thing. And how are you defining the adjustment is alpha times the uh, real target minus the predicted target. Let's say the real one was one, that is, it will be responsive to the therapy. If you give one to responsive and zero to non-responsive, then you just measure the difference 
between the prediction and, and the real value. And then you multiply this with your feature value. So this alpha is very interesting. So alpha is a parameter that you, will, you'll, you, you can try different kinds of parameters. It's typically a very small fraction. So that whatever little change you do is actually a delta change. So this particular sign is very interesting, therefore. You are making a delta shift to the weight using this formula. Let's say I, with my random weights, I have predicted zero here. And the real thing is one. Then, then this is the difference. And you multiply this with your gene expression value, xi. Now you have so many genes, right? x1, x2, x3, x4. So you can multiply. So what you are doing is for ith gene, you are trying to find out how I should adjust the weight. Every gene has its weight, isn't it? Every gene, every gene has its weight. So when you write wi, that means one of the genes, for each gene, how you adjust the weight is determined by this simple expression where alpha is very tiny. That's a point 0.1 or something. And then you say there is a difference. So, so this becomes your delta. So next time, your weight will be the existing weight plus the delta weight. So your wi, so next time, so the iteration, if I just write it mathematically, um, is going to be uh, wi uh, plus um, delta wi. So that's going to be for this, it, this is going to be the, for the next iteration, next iteration. So you kind of adjust your weight to, to try to match your prediction, your, your targets, okay? So, yeah. It can take any value. It can take any, there is no bound. It can go anywhere in a, it's a real number. There's no problem. Okay. But isn't it a very simple algorithm? Do you want to practice this? Want to practice? You will really understand what's going on. Okay, so let me give you a practice problems. Problem, okay? So let's say you have a, okay, let's see if you, if you can do it very quickly. So you have two data points. And by the way, you do it iteratively because this is a vector, right? I don't want to use this terminology, so I'm just, Consciously ignoring, use, you know, avoiding using these terminologies like vector, this and that. This, this just confuse you. <laughs> but basically, it's a bunch of values, right? For every tumor, you will have a bunch of values. So whenever you get a bunch of values, you can, you can run through this set of things, and that will adjust your weight. You can run it for the next time on a different example, and keep looping over them. So you, if, if you have, like, let's say, if you have this many examples, you start from here, then you adjust your weight and then go like this. And after some time, you'll actually converge. This is one way. It's called online learning. So you are learning from one sample at a time. You can also do it in batches. Understood? Let's do a quick, um, but if I want to do that, then probably I'll slow it down a little bit. So there is a trade-off. Um, of how deep you want to go, but probably I'll skip that, okay? I want to teach uh, the more interesting things, but this is pretty simple, right? You, you take, you understand what is a weight, you can start with some random Ws and B. Similarly, you can have a, uh, you can have a formula for updating the B also, right? So your B will be B plus, um, again, the same way, sorry, again, the same way, alpha, exactly the same thing, alpha y minus y pred times x, xi, right? So you also adjust your, sorry, here in case of b, you don't multiply xi. So that's the rule for updating the 
bias. So you basically keep updating your weights and the bias. In bias, you don't have to multiply x because it was not multiplied with x either originally. So that's how you can train a simple perceptron with this step function for the activation. And it will eventually learn to discriminate between things pretty efficiently if the separation is linear. OK? So that's your first topic for neural network. Why is made binary? Because your prediction is going to be, you are going to apply if the summation is, sorry, where did I write? So you are saying if, if this whole thing is greater than this target, then you call it, let's say, zero. Otherwise, you call it one. So you are applying the threshold, which is this one. And that is making a binary output. And then you are comparing that binary output with the real output, the target. And that is being used in this formulation to update your weights and the biases. And you do it iteratively over sample. Yes, sir. Both are? No, you are, you are just learning. The, the threshold is known. You can start with any threshold. Yes, and the bias also ran. Threshold you have. You can also choose the threshold, but you are not changing that. It's a constant. Yes. It will hardly matter, actually. OK? OK, now that's a lot of things we have already covered. So I ideally wanted to take you through some examples. But for the paucity of time, let's skip that, OK? Not a problem. Now we'll go deep a little bit more. Okay, so I will not, I, I really don't intend to solve the back propagation or, you know, trying to show you how the deep learning works. I mean, we cannot do that right now. And that's not needed also. You, you, you should not be feeling that you are missing out a lot of things. It's not really, okay? So basically, your neural network, I'm just drawing it with boxes. These are like input neurons, input layer, okay? So you have some inputs coming in. Again, if we go back to your gene expression example, you are taking all the gene expression values. OK? Now you have some hidden layers, some hidden layers, OK? And then some more hidden layers, and some more hidden layers of neurons. And each circle is a neuron. So this is your input layer. And this is your hidden layer, one, this is your hidden layer, two, this is your hidden layer, three. This is to mimic the human neural network, right, in a simple way. So, and these guys can be connected in any manner, does not causing much challenge on the mathematics side of it, okay? They will remain the same, essentially. So you can connect each of these nodes to all the other nodes, this is fully connected. Then I call it fully connected. If you connect all the nodes with all the other nodes, it's fully connected. But with that, you realize what's wrong happening here. You have too many weights to learn. So your, your learning space is increasing uh, at the same time. You want to keep a check on that. Sometimes you don't want to make it fully connected. And then these guys, in turn, are connected with the subsequent layers and so on and so forth. And this is your deep neural network. And in the end, they are all summed up somewhere. And then let's say some activation function. And this is your output. And this gives you a prediction. This is a prediction which you keep comparing with the targets and get the result, right? And try to minimize this error, the squared error. Right? There are different kinds of functions. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. So, okay. So this is the difference between a human and let's say a lower organism. Let's say cat. I mean, not necessarily a lot of neurons make you more intelligent. It's also how they are connected and a lot of other things. But generally, we can relate it. Correct me if I'm wrong. We can relate more neurons with more intelligence. At least that is what we see in case of uh, we, we always, I don't know how much true, that, but a lot of intelligent people uh, happen to carry a lot more neurons. <laughs> I don't know how true that is. Maybe there are some truth there, but the idea is you understand things at a level of abstraction, right? You learn something like when you, let's say Newton was able to see gravitation from falling off uh, the apple. A lot of people could not. The same event happened. He processed it differently, right? So he had certain kinds of abstractions uh, which are not trivial, uh, you know, which may not happen to others or strike to others. So people have different perspectives. So more, more layers add, add more perspectives. And this you will understand when you study convolutional neural network better. So you see that you may, there are different kinds of filters and, and different layers, and you'll see that every layer is actually learning a different aspect of it. They are, they are kind of capturing different abstractions of the same information. And typically, the, the subsequent layers capture more complex concepts. So these are like simple layers. And then these guys build on whatever is learned here. So they typically capture combination of simple facts which you learn in the initial layers. Okay, and then they make them more convoluted, and that, that's how it, 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 it propagates, okay? So you have different kinds of abstractions, that's all, yeah. Yeah. They would uh, probably not be equivalent. It's, uh, it's interesting. Yeah, so you are saying basically if you have if you have a wider stack of neurons, then you still learn this linear combinations here. You don't learn combinations of combinations. So this is why you probably will not learn as good as what you could have learned. By the way, each neuron combines input and then, and then gives an activation. By the, you don't forget that. It gives some kind of an activation. And the activation functions may be slightly different. You can have different kinds of activation functions combined to give you good results. A lot of it is actually empirical. There is no way you can figure out or tell beforehand that this combination will do best. It's just that. But here, in, 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 in the deep neural network, and the deep could be, you know, it can be deep infinitely, right? A, a lot of layers can be stacked up. That's not a problem. The mathematics doesn't change, okay? And if you do that, then it's no more as simple as what you, what you saw in the previous algorithm. Do you realize that? So basically, you are trying to minimize these errors over all your samples, for all your samples that you have. You are trying to minimize this. You are trying to minimize the prediction and target difference. This is all you are doing. But now, you have the onus to propagate the error back not only to the first layer, not only the weights here, not only the weights here, not only the weights here, but all the way down here also. So the weights are here, here, here. So these are all weights that you have carry their weight edges. And these weights have to be updated, and that's the onerous task. It's not as simple. And here comes back propagation, right? That's, that's the billion dollar algorithm. Okay, so how to back propagate your error because people used to work with only one neuron initially, right? But then let's say I, I can have one more, but propagating it back down to the beginning is, is not trivial. And it can be fixed with simple, yes.
it in layers as You can think like that, yes. I mean, I don't know the construct of the spaces per se, <laughs> humor my mathematics uh, knowledge, but I would say this could be one way of thinking. Yeah. Different levels of abstraction is what I, different perspectives. Um, all right. So now we'll, we'll see how we can back propagate the error. Right, like we did for the simple perceptron, how we can back propagate the error. And I really don't want to get into the nitty gritties of how it is done. I want to give you some ideas. And then, how much time is left? 33 minutes? Okay. No, I, I don't want. <laughs> I just slept for like, you know, four hours on average for the last seven days for various things. But I really love. What I'm doing, uh, basically, okay. So let me let me get back one of the other notes I have. Okay. So how many of you know calculus? All of you. Do you know what is uh, derivative? Excellent already. So a lot of work is done. So tell me, give me an example then. So in this room, okay, um, in this room there is air condition. Okay, so they are placed. Let's say this is the this is the ceiling of the room, and the air condition is placed like this. I mean, this inner inner circuit that you see is, let's say, the air condition, and the, and the middle one doesn't have anything, right? So when you walk in from the room, uh, from the door, right, then you feel very cold, and then when you sit inside the room, right in the middle, then you feel less cold, right? So the temperature um, is uh, dipping towards the end, right? Or let, let, let's say other, other way around. So let's say the AC, there is only one air condition. Sorry, I can make this better. Let's say there is one air condition which is here. Now this guy who is sitting right under that air condition virtually would feel terrible cold. But as you go away from that, you will feel better. You start to feel better. And this room is basically a two-dimensional space, right? The room is two-dimensional, so um, so you can move out of the center. You will feel uh, so. So what will happen is, if you can visualize this, then you are half done. <laughs> then we can directly go into how to solve this with the gradient descent. Okay, but there are two parts that we still need to cover here very quickly. Uh, one is. Uh, uh, one is how we can back propagate the error with the chain rule of derivatives. So there are two things that you really need to know: chain rule, chain rule of derivatives, and the second thing is the gradient descent. Then you know substantial part of your uh, substantial things about neural network. Then you can self-learn pretty much. Uh, gradient, because the amount of new mathematics in neural network or new algorithms in neural network is very limited. That's how I understand it. So basically, once you understand this many things, you are good to go. Okay. All right. So let's start. Keep going with this example. Now, if I were to plot the if I were to plot this, this situation here of how the temperature varies, how the temperature varies with your x and y coordinate, and this is, let's say, the temperature coordinate. So how will it look like? It will look like a bed sheet, right? Because you will have the temperature, it's hanging fr from the, it's a, it's, a, it's a sheet hanging from the ceiling or whatever. So you have a front part of it, and then, so I can just 
So at the center you see there is a big dip. You can imagine what is going on right. This is one side of the shape and then this is this is at your side ok. So now here you see there is a dip once you reach let us say at the center of it at the center of it. So this will have a particular coordinate right of x and y value ok. So the gradient descent method which is used to propagate to, to minimize this error works by the principle of this ok. If I told you this is how the temperature is distributed. So, what does it mean? So, if I write the temperature in terms of x and y your positions in the room, I can write that and if I know this function the temperature function whatever shape and form it could be let us say the shape is like this then then that is a lot of information about it like for every x y you, you know that what is the temperature as simple as that for every x y you plug in the x y values you get the temperature out ok that is fine. Then then and the similar thing if you, if you look at a single dimension I gave you a complex example first even dimension also you can imagine what is going on right. So, you have a value here x and then let us say this is a single dimension I am not worried about any other dimension let us say I am just walking in this dimension if if I come closest to the air condition here then this is where the temperature depends the max forget about there is any other way let us say I cannot even move that side. So, that is that is what is ok. So, this is the temperature in the single dimension this is the temperature curve in multiple dimension. Now, this here the temperature can be written in terms of x. So, you give x you get the temperature you plug in x. So, this is the temperature you give x it will tell you what is the temperature that is fine. Now, what does what, what, what is a derivative of that right what is partial derivative what is derivative. So, so derivative gives you if you say d d of t with d of x so you, you change your coordinate a little bit with that how much of change is there what is the rate of change. But rate of change is not going to be static is it the rate of change is going to change also that depends on what is your x you need to evaluate it at x x equal to x 0 or something right you need to evaluate it at this. So, for example, if you look at this the single dimension thing if you are here the rate of change is massive like if you walk from here to here the rate of change is this much this much whereas if you walk from here to here there is negligible change is not it. So, so that means it is not only about let us say your temperature is temperature is x square right. So, let us say T x is x square ok. So, now you can do a differentiation of that and that will give you T prime x that will be 2 x or something like that right. So, 2 x is fine. So, 2 x gives you a rate of change but rate of change is dependent on where you are right now do you agree ok. So, you understand what is derivative and it is not a trivial information that you could have gotten with a simple uh, you know class 5 class 6 mathematics you still need to use calculus for that there is no other way you can get it no other way at a given position what is going to be the rate of change there is only one kind of mathematics that is this is what I understand. Now, the situation worsens for this ok. Um, so, what happens here here it is a bivariate function and likewise when you have multiple genes you can have multivariate functions here it is a single variable here you have two variables t x y. So, you cannot really differentiate it with respect to you will have to differentiate with respect to something as one dimension. So, here you are differentiating with respect to x here you are differentiating with respect to what 
So then you do partial derivatives, right? So you are you say okay. So I can differentiate this, and now I'll not call it del. What? So I will not call it d, right? So d is here. Sorry. So like like when you write d, that means a little bit. It's like delta, but here you call it do, right? This one. That that indicates partial derivative. So you you do a partial differentiation with respect to one of the items at a time. Okay. Understood. So you just you 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 are not worried about y at all. You don't change your y dimension. You are just walking towards the x dimension, you know, along the x dimension, or you are walking along the y dimension. You are not doing both ways. Understand? So for multivariate functions like this, for multivariate functions functions like this, you write d of t which is a function of x and y, you just write dx or you write dt, sorry, do, we call it do, right, doh, do y, okay? And, and that gives you the direction of the maximum change, maximum slope. So if you, so this things together, is called the gradient. These things together is the gradient. That means it gives you the direction uh, of the rate, you know, the maximum rate of change. That means if you are if you are here, you know which way to go. If you are here, you know which direction, like you can start randomly from anywhere and you follow the gradient, it's just an arrow that will tell you, boss, go this way, okay? So the gradient descent basic, so this is the gradient then. So if you have a function like, um, um, let's say uh, t is 2x plus 2y, let's say this is t, then what will be the gradient of it? So, so if you do a do of t, give it do of x, then you get two, right? So let's let's take a better example. Two x square is two y square. So then you get two x, but you don't care for this, right? It's all constant. And the other guy, you get like do t, do y, that you get two y. Okay. So I'll give you a simple example of how how e yes whatever four x sorry thank you okay so now we'll take a simple example and we'll write the algorithm for the gradient descent and then I'll I'll intuitively tell you that how the back propagation the error is back propagated to the beginning so let's take a very simple example to understand the gradient descent I think that will be a great uh, deal of information for this class. I'll just get rid of this. Okay. I think the yellow is the brightest chalk, so I'm using that. Let's see. Is this vis visible? The yellow one is visible? Perfect. So, um, okay, so the, so the gradient descent algorithm says that you can adjust your parameters. Let's say the parameter is theta, right? And then you want to adjust it. This is the zeroth iteration, then this is the next iteration. Is going to be minus alpha and gradient of j, this big theta. This is the algorithm. And this is called the next position. This is your next position. This is your current position. This is your learning rate. Basically, you can think of it as step size. 
and this is going to be your um, direction of fastest increase, direction the slope basically, direction of increase. You want to go, you want to, direction of fastest increase, you, you want to go opposite to that basically. So this is why the negative sign, you want to go opposite direction, opposite direction. If you are, if it is growing like this, if you are here, if it is growing like this, you want to go to the opposite direction. That is what this negative is actually signifying here. You want to find the gradient. For a single dimension, the gradient is just your derivative, right? But when you have multiple dimensions, then it gets tricky. And we'll see an example with single dimension and multiple dimension. But this is your rule for updating the weights in neural networks. And there is no other mathematics for it. J of theta is basically, this is your error function, let's say. This is your error function, you are trying to minimize the error. Like the observed minus target whole square one upon two, this is a squared error that you are getting. Now based on this error magnitude, you want to shift your weights a little bit. This theta could be a bunch of parameters like x, y, z, or it could be a single one also, right? So you want to, let, like if you have just one gene in your cell, then just one theta, right? If you have multiple, then you'll have a collection of theta. Now, with an example, it will be super, super, super clear, I promise, okay? So don't worry about this if you didn't understand yet. But this is gradient, right? This is the gradient, and the gradient is nothing but the partial, the collection of the partial derivatives. So gradient is going to be a direction, it's a vector in a way, and we'll see that in a bit. So now our objective is to understand how this gradient descent works with a couple of examples, with two examples, real examples, not fake. Okay? Now let's say your function is, I'm just erasing all these things, and we'll do two examples to understand how the gradient descent works. I'll probably cut some of my talk short, but I'll finish this, okay? So, so far good, you understand what I'm saying? Okay, so let's say j theta. Now, why j? j is just an error function, you are reducing the error. Basically, you are walking the valley of errors. You are trying to find out where is the minimum of the errors. That's all, that is, that is your j. So now, j theta is equal to, let's say, theta square, okay? So it's a, it's a single weight, kind of a, like that's it. I mean, j theta is equal to theta square is what you are trying to, and now you are given the task of finding the minimum of it. So you need to find the minimum. So the, this function, if you draw, would look like this, right? We all know. This will probably look like this. Like here will be zero and then minus one, plus one, etc. This is how this function will look like. Now you want to find, you want to start your, uh, start your walk anywhere. Let's say you started your walk randomly. This is your theta, right? This is your theta value, and theta, this, let, let's say this is theta equal to plus one, this is theta equal to zero, and this is theta equal to minus one, and so on, whatever. And then this is your j theta. And you want to find out where it gives the minimum value, isn't it? That's what you are trying to do in neurons also. You are trying to find out the weights that minimizes this error. It's very hard to imagine what's going on. Error is a function. Right now, I'm giving an example with one function. You can imagine if theta is your weight and j is, your, is a function of your weights so that it reduces, it gives you the least error. Any, any, any difficulty in imagining that? No difficulty, right? So if we understand how gradient descent works on this, by and large, we understand how it works on any function for that matter. So what is your j prime theta? 
j prime is another sophisticated way of writing the derivative. So we can write uh, d j d, d theta as well. So j prime theta is nothing but d j. This is d. This is not dou. This is a single dimension, right? So d j d theta, whatever. And that's going to be two theta, isn't it? Okay. So now let's say two more things you are given. I told you that you can start randomly at any particular place. Let's say in this case, you started at one. You started here. That gives you a terrible error, isn't it? You, you started at theta equal to one plus one. It gives you a bad error. The error is here, very high. Now, this is your gradient essentially because you have done the derivative with respect to theta. You, you need to follow that, but follow how? And your learning rate, by the way, according to this algorithm, you have a learning rate, which in this case, I am taking 0.4, let's say, just for the sake of it. 0.4 is the learning rate, no problem. So what will be then theta zero is, so when theta zero is one, the first, first iteration is theta zero is one. We are starting from one. That's a random guess. And then theta one is going to be what? Theta zero minus alpha and then uh, J prime theta zero, right? This is going to be it. So what is going to be theta one? So theta zero is how much? One, this is how much? 0.4, that is alpha, correct? And j prime theta is how much? 2 theta, 2 theta 0. So that is 2 only. So 2 into 1, that is 2. So that gives you how much? 0 0.2, right? That gives you 0 0.2. So if you keep going like this, like next time you do theta 2, and you start with theta 0, sorry, theta what? 1. And you do a minus alpha j prime theta, what? 1. You can calculate this again. And you will see magically it's actually bringing you back here. Very, very, very close to 0. Ultimately, you will come down here after a few iterations. And, and you can say, well, what is the role of alpha here? Alpha is actually controlling how big should be your step. Because if you take a too big step, then you can very well skip your <laughs> minima and again go in a you know, non, not so interesting direction. You want to keep your alpha low. I want to keep checking that with every time, let's say after 100 iterations, there's hardly any change in your J value with the theta then you, you guess that, you know, things are good, okay? So you have reached your position. Now, try to do the same thing this time. This example is clear. Now, the next example is, is little closer to reality, I would say, which is in two dimensions. And here you will see a play of vectors, actually, and that is pretty interesting. So if you have another situation like this, okay, you have a j theta is equal to theta 1 square, theta 1 square plus theta 2 square, okay? So now what will happen? So what does this look like? So this would look like, I don't know how, whether I can draw it even. So this would look something like this. Okay, and then you have, I don't know. So this is basically the, in, this is basically the outside, whatever, inside, outside, whatever. So you can see something like this and, okay, no, it's like this. It's just like this. Okay, it's like this. 
fine. So, the answer is going to be what? You can already find the answer here analytically that 0 is going to be the answer. So, if you are in a hunt of finding out what is the combination of theta 1 and theta 2 that gives you the minimum of it, let us say this is your error, right, theta. It is a bivariate function. So, theta is the composition of theta 1 and theta 2. You have two variables, that is all. So, now you want to go down here. So you, you are trying to figure out and there are, by the way, there are two dimensions here. <laughs> there is another dimension which I forgot to draw. There are two dimensions. So, it is kind of a, is this kind of a plot if you see here, correct? Okay. As simple as that. Now, how to start? Let us say you are, you, you have the gradient of it. What is going to be the gradient, guys? So, the gradient of j is going to be what? So, the gradient of j is going to be a collection of this, right? It is not hard to see. Why so? Because of derivatives or partial derivatives? Because, you know, first time you derive, you do not care. You treat this as constant. Second time you derive this as a constant. Makes full sense. So, now you have that and you are, let us say, starting with, so you need two information. What is your alpha and what is your starting point? Correct. Your starting point is going to be one scalar value or a combination of values. Two coordinates, right? So, your, um, so theta, 0 is going to be, let us say, 1, 3. I would, I would draw it here. This is the iteration. So, I, I mess up with, a, you know, this annotation. So, humor me for that. So, so, you have a starting point 1 and 3, okay. So, that is the coordinate from where you are starting, which is pretty random. It, it might be somewhere here. So, of course, you get an error which is not the least clear. So, now you will have to move. What will be your first move then? It is a vector now, right? It is a combination of values. It is not a single value anymore. So, what is going to be your next move? Your, so, if your first move is this, then your next move is going to be written as theta 0. That is a vector subtraction I am going to write. So, all that you are going to do is you are going to multiply by alpha the j prime theta, right, um, at 0. Actually, this is a bad way of writing it, I guess. So, you want to say that evaluate it as theta is equal to theta 0, right. This is where you are evaluating it. You want to know the rate of change at that position. So, what it is going to be? Can you just calculate the first one? It's going to be 1, 3, and alpha is going to be your how much? 0. 0.1. And then this is going to be how much? What's the vector inside? This one, right? Where, where is the is this one? 2 theta 1 theta 2. So that is 2, 6. Now you can get some answer here that is 0. 0.8, 0. 0. 0. 0.8, and 2.4. If you keep doing that, you will reach 0, 0, very close to 0, 0, 0. If you keep doing like this, so that is precisely telling you what is the combination of x and y you will have to pick. Now, you can do it for 1, you can do it for 2 also, is not it? Like 2, like you can do it with 2 weights also. So, you can do it, do it for any number of weights. It is just going to be a massive multivariate functions, function. So, that is your gradient descent, but that is just the gradient descent, it is still not done. One last thing is left, which I will just state very passingly, I would say, I cannot go deep into it. So, I can take a few questions at this point and then I can spend another 10 minutes on uh, the back propagation of, of the error, but basically this is how this is how you, you come up with the best combination of weights, the best combination of theta 1, theta 2 that gives you the least error.
the, the idea is the same. It's just an engineering trick to propagate the error over a neural network with multiple, I don't know, every time I draw, I'm erasing the, this. So how to propagate this back error? Because you have some initial neurons, you have some initial theta. It's not very easy to think of how you propagate these errors back. Any idea? Some ones who don't know which are. Chain rule is the answer. Chain rules of derivatives. Okay. So let's do some more work. Let me first clean this nicely. Okay, this part is already clean. So I can use this. So so you what what you have learned so far, let us first jot it down. Okay. Let us first jot it down. What did you really learn? So Shaun, I'll keep my talk short, okay. That's fine. This is more important than the talk. The talk is uh, anyway, uh, okay. So number one, we learn about uh, neural network, the, the duality of artificial biological neurons and artificial neurons. That's the first thing we learned. Then we learned about what? Perceptron. Then we learn about perceptron, which is basically this sum and then activation and then output and then adjustment. And then we learned how, so it's like x1, x2, x3, w1, w this, this. Then we learned how to train this, train this for situation which is linear. Do you remember all that now? This was not very difficult. What we were doing was every time we are comparing with the output, we are going through one sample at a time in cycle until we would reduce the overall error, right? Um, and we'd stop if we don't make too many errors. But anyway, so this is what we learned there. Then what is also gave an in intuition of why you need a uh, linear and nonlinear activation function. These are, these are a lot of things, by the way. Linear, nonlinear activation function, right? In linear, we talked about this one, and in nonlinear, we talked about the sigmoid kind of a thing, the step function and the sigmoid. This is just a threshold. And we said, okay, this doesn't make sense. I mean, how can you give it binary thing? But it works, actually. You try that, it'll, it'll work. And then we said, no, we, we use something that gradually increases like a sigmoid. So that, that, also, that also we did. And then we tried to uh, give an idea of uh, derivatives. And uh, you know, given that you guys were already aware of that, it was so easy for me. I didn't really spend too much time there and then partial derivatives. And then we swiftly came to gradient descent. Gradient descent. And then we covered two examples, unidimension and multidimension. Unidimension and multidimension, right? So these are things that we have covered, examples of gradient descent. So that's a lot of things already. Now, uh, we also gave, in between, we gave an idea of deep neural network, deep version of it, which is a stacked up neurons. And basically I said, you can apply any kind of activation function coming out of each neuron here. And then there were nice questions like what this, these layers are doing. Then I said, these are basically different kinds of abstractions and perspectives. You, you know, that's all. And then there was a very nice question that why not I stack it up like this horizontally, then vertically, then I said, okay, you are not combining on the combinations. So you are not really learning abstractions. Okay, so this is, these are the topics that we have covered. So now we'll cover the final thing, which is the back propagation of the errors. Okay, the time is up, but we continue for another 10 minutes. Okay, <laughs> okay.
No, I'm worried about myself. <laughs> okay, okay, thank you. The, the previous coffee is keeping me awake. Uh, thanks for that. Now let me see. Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Uh, fortunately, not so much of a challenge. Uh, like the way you, there are a few ways you can uh, compute the errors. It's basically a classification problem or a regression problem. It's basically going to be squared error, right? That is not the problem. The problem is when you have so many weights, just imagine Chad GPT is 170 billion, probably I'm not wrong, 70 billion neurons, which is more than humans. So now how do you train so many weights? This is very tough. Uh, one good thing is if you have GPUs, because in the end of the day, all these things can boil down into matrix algebra, matrix. So today, the way I'm teaching this is not through matrix algebra. These are naive notations, right? But it looks much more compact when we write it with matrix calculus which you can do maybe next time, but that's not essential, frankly speaking. I am not worried about it at all. Um, so before we go there, let's, so you have understood this, 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 okay. So just let me draw a picture of uh, a reasonable um, lead dip. Let's say linear, okay. So this is how I like to teach a deep neural network. So you, what would it look like, any idea? Like you will have, let's say you have only one input, x1, that's it. Then you have a neuron. I don't want to draw too many things here. So basically you are doing some summation. Here it, you have just one value, one scalar value in x. You are multiplying that with w, okay? Then there is nothing, the sum is nothing basically here. So then you are taking it and you are putting it through a sigma. I'm writing this, introducing this for the first time. That's basically the activation function. It's always written like sigma uh, to represent sigmoid uh, curve that we drew. Uh, it looks like this, right? So that's what you are doing. So basically whatever is inside this goes inside this now. And then the output comes out. And then after that, you apply another weight Okay, and then you again send it, whatever is the output, you call it, let's say, A1 now. So now the A1 times AW, it will come here. W2 will be here. And now you want to pass it through some activation function again. That's what you are doing. And then you can keep doing that until you are satisfied. And then ultimately, there will be a situation where you want to give the output, okay? That could be through some sigmoid also. That's not a problem. It, it could be through the same function, but now you don't want to carry it forward. You just stop there. And then you want to compare, you want to compute the error here, and the error is between the output and the target in a way. And then you are at a task of back propagating this error and what, what, what is the fun in back propagating this error? Because you need to train, you need to find out W1 also. You need to adjust W1 also, which is very far off. It's not adjacent to you. If it is adjacent to you, you can easily find it. But unfortunately, it is not adjacent at all. So it's, it's far off. So this one you can find, okay, D error, D, W, N, whatever you can do, it's fine. But then when, when it goes like this, you don't know how to do that. So this is what we solve using, yes. I can write it as a big fat equation also. I can use a big fat equation also, but this is an excellent question, I guess. I don't know how educated I am to give an answer, but if you have this kind of a neural network, and if you, 
you know just imagine that how much of calculations will go in. So what they do is they use something called dynamic programming. So dynamic programming means that you want to use the derivatives uh, of the shelf without calculating them because every chain will have a different sequence of a different sequence of flow of uh, you know derivatives so you don't you, you want to reuse a lot of these derivatives uh, when you back propagate so you don't want to compute them more than once so that's it roughly that's the answer it will take me a lot of time to break down into it perhaps but you are right i mean you can write it as a continuous equation and it will be big expression and then you can start uh, you know yeah you, you can take the derivatives also this i think this, this will give you the same answer the answer will not be different i guess this is probably much faster and this is this is the uh, cross pollination of two different worlds i mean you guys should know what is dynamic programming right so we should do an algorithm biology thing also not math biology so dynamic program who you okay so you have some idea what is dynamic programming right you reuse things in dynamic programming yeah No, 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 it is not a recurrence relation. Uh, it's not a, so recurrence relation is something different. Uh, I, I'll be super confused with that. Like recurrence relation is like when I write Tn equal to Tn by 2, 2 Tn by 2 plus some kind of a C. This kind of a March sort when we do, we write recurrence relations and solve it. That's, yeah. No, no, I always wrote that. I always wrote that. I mean, if you have a, see the neuron has two parts to it. The first part is the input. And then the input, you, you can, you have an option to just have the sum and send it forward. You don't do that. You take it through some activation function to introduce nonlinearity or whatever. Function of the summation, this linear combination. All right, so I will draw the last piece of figure here, and then through this, I'll, I'll try and explain the idea. So, so let me do that. So if I give you y equal to 4, 2x plus 4 minus 2, and I ask you to find the derivative of this with respect to x, how do you do that? You need the chain rule or not? So what will be the answer? If you want to find out dy dx, then in the, in the first shot, you will consider this as your x, right? And then you will break into it, basically. So the answer will be minus 8, uh, 2x plus 4 minus 2 minus 1 that is minus 3 into 2 right because next time you are basically finding the derivative of whatever is inside so that is multiplied with d uh, 2x plus 2x plus 4 by uh, by dx right and that gives you 2 that's how you solve it which will be minus 16 something this Right. So, so if you are to find out dy dx, you can write it as dy du times du dx, and you can keep expanding that as much as you want. And we capitalize on this particular phenomenon for the back propagation. So now let me draw one last figure, and that's it because uh, yeah, it's already much i guess but it'll take some time for me to draw so just be patient but this this is a pretty good uh 
the presentation that I found on the internet, and I just wanted to give it to you here. So again, linear, but nonlinear is going to be, you can say that, okay, the neural network doesn't look like this, it looks like, but in the end of the day, the mathematics is not very different, trust me. It's just that you will have some addition of the error terms as you propagate. You'll, you'll, prop, you'll get the errors from two people instead of one node forward, right? So that's all will happen. So <clears throat> that's not a big deal. So now let's say take x, okay? Then you have uh, a, a z1, z1 equal to theta 1 t x. I mean, we don't need this t and all these things. Theta 1x plus b1, let's say. And then we have a1, a1 equal to g of z1, right? So this is one function. So this could be an activation function. So here g is an activation function. So this entire thing you can imagine as a what? Neuron, right? So this is your combining, the multiplying some weight, bias, whatever you do, want to do, you can do here. And then you are passing that through some activation function, which is called G. You, you do the same thing next uh, with Z2, theta2, A1, plus B2, and and you have a similar output, which is A2, G, Z2. And this is again a neuron. I always like to express neuron as these two parts. Make sense? So here you have the same activation function again. Okay. And, and then you have one last, and then we'll finish. Uh, now we'll, we'll, we'll on, on that, we'll write what are the derivatives, and what is the chain rule of the derivatives here. So then the Z3 is, again, a big circle, and then Z3 is equal to theta 3, and theta 3 is a weight, by the way. You can figure out now, whenever I'm writing theta or W1, or B, whatever, those are basically your weights. So this is going to be theta 3, A2, A2 you are getting from here, right? This is the output. And then you are applying certain weight to the output, and you are adding some bias, let's say some, yeah, so this, this is B3. And then, uh, then you are, yeah, so, so that's one part. And the second part is, y hat, now this is interesting, y hat is typically used to represent the output, the final output, right? And here you are using a different activation function, which is sigma. And you are taking this z3 here, and this gives an output which is called c. This gives an output which is called c, and that is j, Okay, uh, sorry, C is equal to the error, which is J, Y hat, and Y. Y hat comma Y. y, y hat is your prediction and Y is the real. Okay, so this is the big neuro linear neural network. So how many neurons are there? Three. This is neuron one, this is neuron one, which is probably the input neuron, this is the neuron two, and this is neuron three. And then you have an output and some kind of an error function, J. Any doubt? So let me walk through, yes. So, I mean, I didn't be very explicit here. It's basically 
in whichever way you can find the difference between the y hat and the y and you are writing this as part of the c. So, this is an error your error is a function of y hat and y basically whatever that could be I am not worried about that right now. But let me one more time explain to you what actually happened here you had an x you had a z 1 here then z 1 is basically you are you are writing you are storing everything in the z 1 is a variable and then you have a theta 1 theta 1 is what you are is your weight and then you are multiplying this x to get b 1 and then whatever then you send it to g as an activation function which takes this output which is z 1 and then gives a 1 and, and that could be anything that could be linear ReLU, whatever I do not know it could be some activation function. <laughs> then you are again sending it back into a into a this is into and this is right is coming in going out is again going into this and coming out with again an activation and then goes in then goes out. The same thing is happening the only difference is here you have a sigma here also you could have written g it would not make much difference from the point of view of understanding what I am trying to say. So, now um, if you need to find out let us say d c. Uh, so, what what is your objective your objective is to get d c and d each one of these things right d c d uh, theta 1 theta 3 is not it you want to know that how d c change how a little bit of change in theta 3 makes a change in d c which is an error is going to be impacted right your choice of theta will impact this. So, you want to figure out that what is your dependency that is all. So, so, you want to estimate that. So, how you do that? So, so the first thing you do is d c do I would rather call it do and why do because it is a there are so many parameters there right it is not theta 1 theta not only theta 1 this is theta 1 theta 2 theta 3 whatever n number of things. Now, you have d c and d y hat right the chain rule has started you want to achieve this, but you are starting with this d c d y hat and then d y hat d z 3 correct d y hat z d do sorry do y hat do z 3 correct. So, we have the continuity and then do z 3. Um, so, from here I can directly calculate do z 3 do theta 3 do z 3 do theta 3 correct from here we can get do z 3 I do not know how you are writing do theta 3 theta 3. So, that is the first example of that was easy actually we did not have to go too far we started with the error we started with the error we differentiated it with respect to this output first and then we propagated it further we said how that depends on your z 3 and how z 3 depends on your theta 3. And now you keep doing that uh, you know as long as you want. So, the next one will be z 3 a 2 again do z 3 do a 2 and so on and so forth ok. So, the good part is the, the, the fact that it, it utilizes the goodness of dynamic programming is because these are the things this this computations are being used by everybody right you see this one is also needed to come up to here this one is also needed for this guy. So, as you go forward you are always using everything here, but you are without computing it every time ok. 
So I kind of tried to give you <laughs> an idea of how the error is propagated. And this is the error, guys. The C is your error, error term. I can write it E also just for your ease. So you are kind of trying to find out, actually you wanted to find out do error do theta 3 or do error or do theta 2, but you ended up getting this sequence of partial derivatives, which you can painstakingly solve and you get some very simple uh, uh, set of equations to update the weights basically. So in the end of the day, I mean, if I just write it for, for the, uh, um, and this is finally the back propagation. So what's happening here? Once you find out all this, um, if you remember the, the, the uh, gradient descent example, you were doing the differentiation and you, you were using that to update your weight. The same thing is happening here. All these partial derivatives you are evaluating are being used for adjusting your weights of the neural net, right? And if you use a simple sigmoid activation function, which is this, actually the output is conspicuously simple. <laughs> I'll tell you, all these things you don't need to remember if you just want to get an output out of it. Okay, if you just want to know that what would happen had I just used a sigmoid function. By the way, this is not as simple. You could have one more neuron here, right? You could have one more neuron here. And this guy could have been connected to this neuron. This guy could have been connected to this neuron. The connections could be successively between every two neurons. You can also determine that, okay, I don't want all these connections. I can probably keep it sparse. Those are all decisions you can take. But the mathematics is not going to change. It's a bit taxing to mind to imagine, not the partial, the math is actually very simple. But when you think of this in the context of this back propagation algorithm, it becomes a bit convoluted. But in the end of the day, let me, uh, just to finish this, one last set of things that I want to write to show you how back propagation, if you, if you solve all these gradients, then final output will be, just I am copying from somewhere, between two nodes, let's say W, J, I, you will have some kind of an alpha that is the learning rate, okay, followed by some D, uh, J, O, I, O stands for the output and I'll tell you, there, there is a difference between the last node, the output node and the hidden node. Their expressions are going to be very different. All the hidden nodes will happen to have similar kind of expression and on the output nodes will happen to have uh, you know, similar expression. So I, I really don't have the time uh, right now to do that, but basically this is going to be like, just let me write first. Ej, this is target and output, the predicted observed output. If j is a, if j is an output unit, neurons, neuron, and this will be dj equal to oj, one minus o sub j, and summation of del k w k j if this is a hidden layer for all k, right? So the output layer, it is very simple. These are all, this, this, is, this is the adjusting factor. So this is the weight adjustment for every weight. So you'll just add this delta to every weight. And how that is calculated, you have certain learning rate. And depending on whether it is an output node or whether it is a hidden node, you have a certain way of calculating the, uh, you know, error at a particular neuron. And this is the quantification of the neuron. And you multiply that with the output. And the quantification is also pretty simple. It's basically a function of the outputs and the difference between the target and the observed.
Okay, so I can really show you an example on a different day, not today, of how with simple these three things you can update every weight of a neural network, and that is a derivative that that's that came from that mathematics actually. If you basic th this particular expression comes from when you have a sigmoid function, which is one by one plus e raised to minus x. Right, so that is the sigmoid function. So whatever you insert, you insert x, you get this as an output. If this is your function, if this is your activation function, if this is your activation function, then after all this maths, you will get this simple algorithm for updating the weights of the back propagation. So with that, I would like to stop and I can take a few questions and then meet at the top. <sighs> Okay, that's a long one. I don't know how we'll keep stop. The summation is of um, the summation is all the nodes that are all the nodes from where the errors are being propagated back. Okay, so these k's are other neurons to which this guy is j is connected. And their error terms are rippling back to it in the form of the summation. That's a valid question, I didn't explain it. I think that's pretty much neural networks for you. I, I, basically, if you, uh, follow on from here, you'd be able to self-discover most of it. If you understood my lecture, special things, and then the implementation is easy. Yeah. I can send uh, the difference. Unfortunately, the way it is taught is very disturbing. <laughs> it's not that hard. People make it hard. Uh, but what I can do is, I can probably share a few resources with you. Uh, Right now, I don't have it handy. I made some, uh, I, I, I kind of did a patchwork. I created a collage of all these things, just took a picture from the internet, and this is how I make my notes, right? <laughs> you know, all over the places. So I can share the sources from where I have made this lecture. Maybe that will be a good starting point. And those are extraordinary. Like the fact that it becomes much easier to understand neural network with a single have we ever seen that? No. It's very easy to follow. Much easier. I'm not saying very easy. But the moment you have so many things going on, like, you know, multiple neurons in a single layer, it becomes unnecessarily complicated, which is not needed at all. All, all that are taken care of by this summation in the end of the day. So finally, you want to do some examples by hands <laughs> to understand how things flow. You start with, I would say, if you are, if you have some basic mathematics knowledge, you can, you can make your own activation function. Like you say, the activation function is x square. That's an activation function. And you stack them up in a linear neural network, and then try to see if you can flow the gradient back, and stuff like that. And it's not trivial. I'm not saying it is easy. At least to me, it is not so easy. All parts are very easy to understand, but when it comes together, then it is difficult. Yeah. Not necessarily. This is just an example. You can take any G, F, or anything. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>